This is Fearless Beauties, a podcast dedicated to developing voices of color in the beauty industry. We are talking to estheticians, skin specialists, and business owners to uncover best skin practices, tactical career tips, and ultimately, how we can create a better beauty industry together. I'm your host, Mary Nielsen. And I'm your other host, Taylor Phillip. Welcome to episode six of the Fearless Beauties podcast. Today, we're talking about wellness, which I'm so excited to talk about today. What about you? Yeah, I've been looking forward to this episode as well, talking about um, and just doing a little bit of research and thinking, just thinking about it gave me some new perspective on the whole wellness industry. So um, I think there's some work to be done. Um, I think kind of calling it out is a way to get started. Yeah, I think uh, when I was researching as well, I I was kind of stumped because, of course, I'm in the mental health field and we don't you don't really hear wellness often in the mental health field, believe it or not. So studying psychology for seven years now, wellness is not something I heard of. So I literally had to look it up like, okay, what does wellness actually mean to people? Because it can mean something different to everyone. What's funny, I looked up Pfizer on the Pfizer site, what wellness actually means. And just to give you just a couple words, it says it's the act of practicing healthy habits on a daily basis to attain better physical and mental health outcomes so that instead of just surviving, you're thriving. So I really, really like that. Yeah, I like that word of thrive, Mm -hmm. meaning more than just maintaining, but you're gaining some ground into into your health. And I think that pertains to both physical and mental health, right? I was also thinking, it seems like as I was doing my research, it seems like when we think about, well, when I hear wellness, the first thing I think of is physical. I think the mental part of it has kind of taken the back seat. And I think the mental part of it is something that needs to trump physical in a sense, because you know, it's kind of not talked about. I think we talked about that in in the last podcast or the one before that, where going to a therapist or doing meditation or anything, it's kind of seen as, well, it used to be seen as, oh, you're weak or why do you need to see a therapist? But now we're starting to become more trendy. Like everyone is getting more comfortable with saying that, oh, I need to take better care of my mental health, or yes, I'm seeing a therapist and I love it. Uh, So I think the mental health part needs to be talked about a little bit more. Yeah, I completely agree. But my inbox is inundated from businesses or advertisements or marketing towards places that claim to be wellness centers. And a lot of people that I talk to that are in the maybe aesthetics industry or or medical aesthetics, they say that, well, we want to move into wellness. And I'm like, well, what does, what does that really mean? Is that just like a broad term where you're looking at people more holistically? I mean, I think that part is great. But then there's other things that I think are a little bit centered around affluent white people. Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> Let's just say it. <laughs> it's just yeah. call it out there. You know, and I think one of the one of the funniest and most interesting ones was what is Gwyneth Paltrow. Yes. And her, you know, goop. And the first I heard about goop was like last year when I saw that she was selling a candle. And it's like, it's not like she's selling like one of those big Yankee candles that are the big sort of like quart size jar. It's just a tiny little, not quite a votive, but the neck size up kind of candle for $70. And the title of the candle is, the scent is smells like my vagina. Yeah, uh uh-huh, (laughs) uh-huh. I'm telling you, I was looking at Goop's uh, shop site and I was, my mouth was just open. The things that they're selling on there, I'm, okay, so one thing I do want to point out, wellness is 
what you make it. I feel like everyone has their own definition of wellness. But let's be honest here. Wellness isn't, you know, mascara or um, the G-spot vibrator or a candle that says this smells like my orgasm. Are you kidding me? So I feel like there's a certain amount of of maybe consumer, I want to say consumer deception or misrepresentation mm-hmm. that somehow people need some of these things. And I, I actually saved an email that I got that says, add lunar services to your treatment menu, right? So you want to add services to your treatment menu that are based on the different phases of the moon. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And when someone receives the correct treatment, according to the moon cycle, their energy will be restored and physically their body will be healed and rested. Yeah. (sighs) And so- I don't even, I don't know what to say. When people see this, right? Lunar treatments can be good for releasing unresolved emotions and longings that are blocking the flow of energy in the body. Yeah, Uh, they're really marketing the heck out of that. And so is it my, because I have a belief in Western medicine, is Mm -hmm. this an Eastern, you know, medicine foundation? Or is this just a bunch of, you know, malarkey? Is this a bunch of like new age language that's being fed to people that are hungry for trying to find a solution to maybe their physical health issues, their aches and pains, or maybe their, even their mental health. And like, oh, well, I just need to come in and get my treatment during the right phase of the moon. Right. Is that the thing? I've, I think the only word that's coming to my mind is, uh, trendy like it's, it just seems like on trend with it just seems so TikToky. I don't know unsubstantiated maybe that's the word unsubstantiated mm-hmm. and as I'm looking through the the goop site I was looking at the skincare uh portion of it all and I would love to get you and some other Estes in here to talk about like the ingredients in these situations because it just seems like all marketing and not enough uh, substance, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like this podcast should be titled Avocado Toast. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it's the avocado toast of wellness. It's the the elitist, it's the avocado toast of everything. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Like, avocado toast is this huge thing, like... They sell it for like $25, $30 because it is the trendy thing. And it's, and I was even looking at one wellness brand and their logo was an avocado. And I'm just like, what the heck? And they're just selling rose diamond eye serums, eye creams and rose diamond cleansers. And I really want to know what is in these, um, these uh, skincare. Well, I, actually, I was reading yesterday that, you know, there's certain uh, buzzwords right now. Bitcoin is one of them and um, oh, blockchain. And there was a company and I think they sold like ketchup and they changed the name of their corporation to something blockchain and their stock price went up like 83% mm-hmm. with just the word blockchain in their in the message. And so I'm like, Oh, my goodness, we have to, I think, create some sense of, I think the word that we want is be being some critical thinking skills to sort of think some of these things through. I remember I did have a client, but like, Hey, how are you doing? She's like, Oh, so relieved. And I'm like, great. Why? What's happening? And she's like, well, I found out the reason I'm not able to lose weight is because I've been eating wrong for my blood type. And I'm like, what? I've never heard of this. Oh yeah. I'm a blood type, whatever. Oh, and I'm eating completely wrong for my blood type. My eyes should be eating whatever. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's a thing, but I think people, and particularly when you have 
affluent people, they also have, I think, issues with, well, body image issues, and they're looking for answers for that. And so the whole celebrity thing is very big, and there's a certain draw to believe the authenticity of the celebrity, not realizing, of course, that they're being paid a gajillion dollars to endorse this. It feeds on women's insecurities, also, I think, feeds into the idea that there's something wrong with us. There's all these different, you know, we got to be on the, what's it called? You're getting the toxins out of your body. You're on, you're on a, I'm on a detox. Detox. There we go. I'm on a detox diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a bunch of those. I was even thinking like more about the elitist wellness brands everything's so expensive. So for example, um, the counseling center that I intern at, they offer psychological services to all incomes, to all socioeconomic backgrounds, to everyone. Um, And I have a lot of Hispanics and African Americans come in and they have never been to a therapist before. And I think it's because mental health, it's expensive, right? It is it is what it is. It could be $100 a session. It's expensive. But at the counseling center I work for, I believe like 60% of the clients there do not pay anything. I think what we're trying to do is normalize effective like mental health Like, make it accessible to everyone and let them know that, no, you do not need to make a certain amount of money to have, you know, the best care. So I think that's what these elitist brands need to focus more on is making more inclusive wellness spaces and not focusing Focusing more on the wellness part of it and not on the price tag, if that makes sense, because it kind of shuns people away and people don't think that they deserve what these brands are putting out because they cannot afford it. And that's just not true. Like if you can't afford the silk pillowcase or um, the avocado face mask for $60, it doesn't mean that you don't deserve to take care of your mental health or that your mental health doesn't matter. So more wellness brands need to become more inclusive by offering more free resources or even like podcasts or opening up like events in lower economic neighborhoods so that everyone can get a piece of the pie. Well, and from, you know, my perspective, I'm sorry, more reason to have universal health care, because I think that particularly as women, we wait and wait and wait to take care of our health until sometimes almost in a crisis mode. And then for people to feel like they can't afford it is just makes things even worse. Also, I think uh, with COVID and this whole pandemic, I think it's brought people to realize like, okay, I need to take my mental health more seriously. Um, And I think those elitist brands are taking advantage of the situation like, okay, everyone needs mental health or wellness right now. So let's let's get in, let's get in here. So all the celebrities are taking part of it. I think like I saw the wellness industry is like a $4.5 trillion industry. I was researching a lot of um, black owned and women owned wellness brands. And I realized that most of them offer free resources. And if they do offer products, it's like around the $20 range or their memberships are $17 a month. Um, They have free events, things like that, where the uh, elitist wellness companies, you know, they have $300 athleisure pants and you could work out on a mirror that costs $400, things like that. Or you you buy a, a band on your wrist that's like a watch and a GPS at the same time and it checks well all that. the whole peloton right yeah. the peloton you know I did spend the weekend Thanksgiving weekend with my oldest daughter who 
is an affluent white woman. And uh, she was talking, she has not joined the Peloton frenzy, but um, talking about how everyone where she works, they all have their Peloton and they're very proud to wear their Peloton t-shirts and this whole thing that some, and I am like, aren't you just on a, on a stationary bicycle? You're on a stationary bicycle and you're watching a video of someone else on a stationary bicycle telling you what to do. And somehow that, that that just blows my mind almost in the same way when I think of like people, what people buy water? Why don't you just go to the sink and fill up your glass? And sell the water for like $5. Yes. And so why are people, what has made them buy into this idea and maybe it's the sense of community, right? I can get that sense of community where there's other people and all of that. But the cost of what that monthly membership cost is makes it elitist, I guess. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, and like you mentioned, I think it's the uh, social connectedness of it all. Like we want to feel like we're a part of something, especially during this pandemic, we want some type of normalcy, which I get. But like you mentioned, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to come with such a price. Um, those Peloton, like, of course, like, I think I would even want one, but am I going to buy one? No, because I could easily just say, hey, gather up some friends and let's go for a run or let's go in the park and do a a workout. And that's free. I'm trying to find the article I was reading and I always wonder if these articles are written by, um, are they written by African-Americans or are they written by Caucasians? Because it, it blows my mind. I'm trying to find it. They were talking about the whitewashed, they said whitewashed wellness brands. And I honestly think the, uh, the author is white. And I think that they called it, yeah, the ghettos, the elite ghettos of wellness. And I'm going to send you that article. I'll put it up on the Fearless Beauty Beauty's Instagram. But they're saying that the ghettos of wellness are the people flying to that dreamy tropical island for a stay at a five-star wellness retreat and driving past the slums as they enter the gates. That's the ghettos of wellness. Or people who are paying $200 for a 90-minute massage. So it's all the things you can now purchase in the name of wellness in our ever richer, gentrified global cities. But in the backdrop of all that are income inequality behind that city. So I thought that was very interesting. Well, I think those travel, right, those travel uh, or destination wellness retreats or y- your yoga retreat or whatever, but also just talking about the cultural appropriation that comes from taking, and this was actually a new concept for me, was thinking about yoga and that yoga actually came, I mean, it wasn't some sort of thing that was developed by Lululemon. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that yoga actually came from India and was a serious discipline and now it's sort of just turned into the um the yoga mom right and that has shifted people's view and understanding of the discipline of yoga versus now all the different trendy you know yoga things they have that are that are out there or the quinoa, right? When quin- when you talk about the avocado toast, quinoa is the, you know, that's the other. Oh, gosh. But, you know, people in Peru can't even afford to eat quinoa, which is a native <laughs> crop to them because of the industrialization of the growth of the crop and exporting it to the United States for consumption. Mm-hmm. And that's just amazing to me as well. So uh, I think it's just calling out some of these habits and trends of people and, and even people who are involved in doing this. Think about what you're doing and are there other ways of looking at it, tipping the box over or, or getting outside the box to think about wellness, um, breaking, breaking down that 
culture that that wellness has to be kind of an elitist thing where you have to go to your, I don't know, $100 a month gym Mm -hmm. wearing your $300 uh, what's the other one? Other popular brand yoga pants and all that kind of stuff. Just is Fabletics one? I mean, <laughs> I like Fabletics, but <laughs> uh, yeah, something like that, or um, like you mentioned, Lululemon. That's huge. But even like the the incense, acupuncture, the crystals, like that's cultural appropriation right there as well. It's like we're using all of those things and making it. I, this is the only word I could think of is trendy. We're making it self care, quote unquote, and all the expensive products and treatments and detoxes. Those are self care. Is it? I don't think so. But I just think it's being used the wrong way. And maybe if if we are if we are going to be using those things, why don't we bring in uh, people of color to actually like educate us on why incense and acupuncture and crystals are healing yeah how they are how they are healing how that right um theory works right why it doesn't and getting ha- more educated rather than just you're right exactly um exactly so they're basically they're taking cultural cultural practices and making it their own so Maybe we can change that by bringing in those cultures and having them educate us. I think that's that's something they should definitely do. I think that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. You know, I think here, I mean, from my perspective, because you know I'm a think it, do it. Um, yeah, you are. Looking at what things that we do use here, you know, we incorporate gua sha, we incorporate stone rollers. Well, mm-hmm. I know those are not you know, culturally here, but I know that they do come from Eastern beauty trends. And so having someone come and talk to us about that historically Mm -hmm. and how that, and it has value. I do believe, you know, that it does have value in terms of lymphatic drainage and all of that. But really, I should take a look at things that we are using here and how we can talk about historically where they've come, learning more a little bit about historically where they've come from so that we can have an appreciation for how they're used today. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, like the turmeric, turmeric is big. Um, yes, I'm currently taking turmeric for my... What, inflammation? Inflammation. Yeah, it's a big thing in inflammation. But I think, I mean, I, what that comes from India. And yes. matcha, matcha comes from Japan. And quinoa comes from, like you said, Peru and South America. Let's bring in those cultures and have them teach us. And then I think what's also horrible is I see a lot of stuff on TikTok where they are kind of overproducing these things with those healing properties in there, but it's actually not doing anything because they're uh, chemically just tampering with it. Oh, so by the time they've processed it, it's taken out the it's, wellness part of it. It's it's all gone. So we just need to have, you know, more all natural. Um, just say, I don't know, just bring in the educators where it actually comes from. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's too much. Like sometimes I'm afraid to uh, buy certain things because I have to look at everything and the fine print and is it you know where was it produced and factories where it's like where you're dropping chemicals in it to whatever I don't know all the terms but not all of it is good anymore after you put all that bad crap in it no I think it all it all I think it also calls us to just become more conscientious consumers and I can say from our uh, from our perspective, like in my own personal life, when I, you know, now I've gone vegetarian. So what does that mean? Okay, so we made the switch, no dairy milk, we went to almond milk, but then looking at almonds and the almond industry, and what almonds do in terms of 
greenhouse gases and how much land it takes to produce almonds. Well, no, we don't want to do that. So that doesn't seem conscientious, a conscientious consumer who's concer- concerned about the environment. So now we have to go, we've actually gone off of almond milk uh, mm-hmm. and moved to oat milk just because yes. it's required us to like dial it down to become more committed to values that we say that we have. So I personally say I have these values, but then does my life reflect that? And just becoming much more conscientious and intentional about living the values that I I speak that I have. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. And that's very well said. And I can't understand how you're on. So here it takes us back to I'm on a limited budget. I'm I'm a single mom and I have three young kids and I don't have time to do all this research and I don't have time to like necessarily live my values because I've got to live within my paycheck. You know, I think you have to start out with baby steps in just deciding what you can do and then making sort of incremental changes toward it. I don't think people can make an entire lifestyle change. Yeah. And I've always wondered, like what you said about it it being too expensive. I've always wondered why in the world does it cost so much to be healthy? Like I'm trying here. I'm doing my best. But if I have to pay, I don't know, five to seven dollars for organic products, I'm just going to get frustrated and take my behind the McDonald's because (laughs) that is just ridiculous. And I've always that is the question that's always on my mind is why does it cost so much to to be healthy, to actually eat products that come from the ground? I mean, it comes from the ground. Uh, It's just it, it blows my mind. But the products that are like made in factories like, you know, apples and those strawberries, they're they're made in factories, some of them. And. Uh, which I think is just crazy to me. Oh my gosh, it blows my mind. But then once you get the organic strawberries, it's like five dollars a pound. And you know we're we're doing our best here. We're doing our best. That's all I have to say. But I just wanted to read this really quick. I think we talked about it already, but it just uh, it just spoke to me. But it's from Asia, and she said. Um, Uh, We were talking about the matcha and the quinoa and the turmeric and how like they all come from these different countries. And they said that she said it's she's really sick of the white savior complex and it isn't just whitewashing. It's detrimental to communities. It's removing people from their own culture and screwing up economies in other countries. So like people in Peru, they can't even afford to eat their own quinoa, like you mentioned, Mary, because it's so popular here in the U.S. It's really affecting home countries, people in home countries. And I just think that's so sad. It's like, I I wonder what those people are thinking. (laughs) Like, wow. And I know we want a melting pot, right? We want a country that's a melting pot, but we also want people to have pride in their heritage. And if you grow up thinking that yoga has come from some white women, you know, wearing Lululemon who decided to start who decided to start this wellness trend of doing these, you know, body movements and and mental health kind of focusing things and you don't know that that actually started in India, yet you are you know, possibly of of Indian descent or Southeast Asian descent. And then I think it robs them of that pride in their heritage. If you get quinoa, but you don't realize that, oh, this actually is agricultural product from Peru, and you are South American, and you don't, you, it robs them of that cultural pride. So I think um, what we can like really talk about is well, one, the question is, should everyone have access to wellness products? And I think, the, of course, the question is yes. But also, well, no, I'm going to interrupt and say, but what is the wellness product? Okay, is it some yes. sort of one of the goop, 
like I was seeing what the golden egg that you have to like stick up your vagina. And... I saw that. What I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't want anything up there. I. I... <laughs> is that like some kind of like pseudoscience that makes us think that this is something that you need? But yes, in terms of like true, honest wellness, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And also, like, how can we stay well without the price tag and the shame? That's a big thing. Shame around not choosing the best of the best. So how can we take the shame away from not being able to afford the athleisure wear that, you know, our favorite celebrity is wearing or the mirror thing, that mirror exercise thing or the Peloton or buy like the latest wristwatch that gives you all of these um health statistics about your Faces body of the moon oh right. it's it's, re- <laughs> it's redonkulous but like how can how can we stay a- away from that that shame is i and i think well i think it's kind of um <laughs> Those communities that are like the lower socioeconomic communities, like start building wellness in those communities. And like, is holistic the word? But I mean, just like the, ah, there was this, it's called Naya. And uh, it's a woman of color. And she opened up like a wellness place in Bronx. And I was looking at her um, website and her motto is black folks breathing. And I just love that so much. And she does, you know, um, meditation sessions and um, like they do check-ins where they gather people of color and the BIPOC community and youth to just talk about, you know, their mental health. Like that's wellness right there. It doesn't have to cost. You can just gather people and just have a conversation. Um, and also they have a podcast and anti-racism resources, articles. Um, and like the only thing on her shop site is um, I guess they're doing like a play and they're asking people to come watch their play. Just having an awareness like, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't thought that, you know, this sets an image or this is an image of exclusivity. What I'm doing isn't inclusive. So I want to make that shift and that change. And then just being intentional about it. Yeah, that's the word intentional. Like we say we want to do something, but you know. That's right. So people think it, do it, think it, do it. (laughs) But yeah, anyway, I think uh, we kind of hit all the points. It's um, getting rid of the the exclusivity of wellness and actually thinking about what wellness means to you. Yeah, I think that's a good point, too, is what does wellness mean to me? Uh, I think shifting our mindset from wellness means I have to be a size five and I have to have this kind of hair and I have to have this kind of, you know, whatever income. income exactly. And so I think, you know, look, re-examining what wellness really means. Yeah. Take the social media out of it. And I also think what is, what is crazy is that of course we're in the, the generation of technology, like it's never going to go away, but those screens have a negative effect on your mental health. And I think everyone knows it, but we can't get away from them. So these brands, elitist wellness brands, it's all based off technology. But if you look at the um, the Black-owned, women-owned, or people of color-owned wellness brands, they all have to do with uh, face-to-face, Um, or just like meditation here, download this so that you can know what to do type of products. They all get away from the screens. So I think that kind of tells you something. Yeah, I think actually a discussion I had this morning with another educator was the amount of anxiety that is present in our younger, the younger students that we have 
here at the school, they all, not all, that's too generalizing, but many, many of them deal with social anxiety, intense social anxiety. And we wondered if that anxiety has to do with they have spent so much of their time um, in a virtual world where they don't, where they're communicating mostly by text with people, that the, the idea of actually sitting in a classroom or in uh, like hands-on demonstration, things with other people in a classroom creates this level of anxiety because they're just not used to that personal contact. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and also being all virtual, you have the access to see all types of things that don't look like you or what people say you should look like. And then once you get in front of um, people or, you know, the skinny girl with the flowing hair, you start to feel bad about yourself because you don't look like that. And since all those brands say that's what you should look like or what is pretty, you feel, you know, disgusted with yourself or you feel like you shouldn't eat uh, um, anymore. Yeah, so that's where the um, bulimia and anorexia comes in. It's it's a domino effect. So I don't think it starts with screens, but screens has a, a big part, big part of it. So let's get away from the screens. Yeah. And I'm saying this as a millennial, okay? Get get away from the screens. I I think when I was in high school, I started doing this, which is crazy. That's when high school, I think was when the iPhone four came out. So it was a huge thing. I didn't have the iPhone four, but everyone did. I think once a week, I would turn my phone off for a day. And I was in high school people. That's like unheard of. I would turn my phone off for a day. My best friend would be like, where were you? I was like, oh, it was my day to turn off my phone because I just couldn't deal with it anymore. Uh, and I think that's something I need to start doing again now. Just turn off my phone for a day. Focus on taking a walk outside or spending time with my daughter more or um, reading. <laughs> Not reading an ebook, but actually picking up a book and reading. So, well, um, like I end every podcast, you can always find us on Instagram at Fearless Beauties, our website, fearlessbeauties.org, Facebook, Fearless Beauties. And uh, you can email, email, email us, uh, Taylor at fearlessbeauties.org if you really want to get there. <laughs> but um, I really hope you all enjoyed the podcast. And I think, Mary, um, we're going to be taking a break, right? I think we're taking a bit of a break and we will be back in 2022. Woohoo! With new yes. and exciting episodes. So, yes. yeah. I really hope you all have a happy holidays. Stay safe out there. Thank you for listening to Fearless Beauties, a show dedicated to elevating voices of color in the beauty industry. I'm your host, Mary Nielsen. And I'm your other host, Taylor Phillip. Until next time, keep educating yourself, remember to stay open, and be fearless in the pursuit of creating a better, more inclusive world. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Special thanks to my co-host Taylor and our producers at Quill Inc.